hedonism. Uh, it's the pursuit of pleasure, uh, sensual self-indulgence. Uh, we're all hedonists uh, to some degree. Uh, we all look for that instant gratification. It's much like eating an ice cream cone, for example. It's sweet, <laughs> it's creamy, bathes your brain in pleasure. And usually when you have one, you want another one. It's that mm, instant kind of gratification that's not very good for you sometimes, too. So my hedonism, my pleasure, my ice cream is adventure. Um, so behind me here, these are my roots, my wilderness roots uh, in North America, self-propelled, various modes. And from 1995 till about 2007, I did uh, these kind of adventures in the wild purely for the adventure, the visceral pleasure and enjoyment that satisfied myself, uh, be it uh, canoeing across Canada or circumnavigating the Haida Gwaii archipelago by kayak or cycling 2,000 kilometers in the winter across the Yukon and Alaska wilderness. All these things I did for, it's kind of a twisted pleasure, but pleasure for myself and it was just for, for my own enjoyment, my own uh, being out there and moving through space and time in the wilderness. It's the freest way I know how to live when you're out there adventuring. Um, no one can tell you what to do. It's a very anarchistic place. You're outside the realms of society. Your society is yourself, your buddy, and the canoe, and you can do whatever you want. All you have is just you know, weeks and weeks of wilderness ahead of you, and, and you're in the moment at all times. When I do my journeys, I always go to a place I've never been to before. It's always fresh. And also when I go there, I know I'll never go there again because there is so much to explore on this planet. So when I'm there, when I see that first curve of the river, I'm never going to see that curve again. When I go over that mountain, I'm never going to see that mountain again from that perspective. So it really puts you in the moment. So it's a very addictive way to live. And as I said before, I had to pay for this addiction. And I did it through filmmaking. So I started filming my trips in about six years into my adventuring career. A local company in Vancouver uh, would give me the camera. They'd cover all my expenses. I just had to go out there and do my adventure, give them the raw footage, and then just whoosh, head off an adventure again. It was a very easy way to kind of keep in my pleasure pod of adventure. But then after a couple of years, they actually produced something with my raw footage. And the film was the, the series they produced was on television in Canada. Probably no one here saw it before. But it was called X-Quest. And X-Quest kind of falls somewhere between toddlers and tiaras <laughs> and Duck Dynasty. <laughs> so they basically turned my footage into reality television, the lowest common denominator. Um, so not very reverential to the wilderness. Um, it was kind of like ice cream, you know, it feels good initially, but then you kind of feel crappy afterwards and want to take a nap. So, it kind of made me reflect on why I was filming in the wilderness. You know, what is it about the wilderness that uh, is so important to me deep down? And the wilderness, uh, it's where I feel most comfortable. And usually where a person feels most comfortable is a place they call home. So the wilderness really is my home. And so when I come here in the city, it's kind of like not really my sweet spot. That's my sweet spot out there. So this is kind of like a reset before I go home again. And what I was ignoring, you know, I had my blinders on, really, for those first 12 years of adventuring and my first couple of years of filming. Um, I was ignoring the degradation that was happening in the wilderness, that industrialization was slowly clawing away at these areas I travel through, threatening the very base life that sustains everything on this planet. Um, I'd be going through an area, having a great time, but ignoring the reality of what was going on as far as uh, large-scale industrialization of wilderness areas. So I literally did not see the forest for the trees. I didn't see the big picture. I didn't see the power that this camera could have for good and to give back to these areas I traveled through. So I cut ties with the production company, and I went out on my own, decided I'm going to do everything start to finish, conceive, uh, shoot, edit, produce a film that would give back to one of these beautiful areas. So in 2007, I decided to do a 3,000-kilometer journey 75 days with my friend Taku Hokoyama through the uh, wilderness of uh, the boreal forest wilderness of northern Ontario. Um, and this area is an area twice the size of England that's completely roadless. Um, it's pristine old growth forest. It is the most intact part of the world's largest carbon bank. It provides oxygen for the planet. 
So I want to do a trip that I kind of straddle the industrialized and non-industrialized parts of the boreal forest and then do a film about it. So we started off for the first few weeks in the, in the beautiful, untracked boreal forest, crystal clear water, endless, pristine forests, bountiful wildlife. And then on about day 40, we had to turn south. And we turned south on the Metagamy River. And this may look like a wilderness river, but it's actually an industrialized river. It's controlled by four power-generating dams upstream. So we worked our way for a couple hundred kilometers up this stream. The water was no longer crystal clear. It was brown. It was slimy on the rocks, no fish to be seen, but we finally got to that first dam one evening. So we camped there the evening before, we had to portage around it the next day. We woke up the next morning, and the river downstream was gone. We'd actually paddled up this the, the evening before. And that kind of crystallized things for me and what I was doing out there on that journey. Um, I was still, we were still hundreds of kilometers from the closest community, and there was no one else there to bear witness for the wilderness. Um, I had the privilege of being able to travel through these wilderness areas for all those years, and I hadn't buried witness, bore witness to it, but now I was going to do it, and I did do it. And even more importantly than witnessing what was happening in the industrialized part of the boreal forest, was talking to First Nations, indigenous people in these remote, isolated communities. They're the only people up there. They've been there for thousands of years, an amazing oral history and t tradition and connection to the landscape. So my journeys are just, I'm just a tourist passing through, and I show the landscape, but every issue I deal with in my films is always spoken to by the people who live up there, who have this connection and tell us really why the land is important up there and why it should be protected. And this was very difficult for me. It got me out of my, my pleasure pod, my hedonistic life of just being able to, say, wave at someone from shore, or have a polite conversation when I'm picking up a parcel. Um, but now I had to actually engage people in difficult issues, and this was hard. This is no longer ice cream. And then you get home, and you have all this footage, and suddenly I have to learn how to edit. Hundreds of hours of editing turning into something cohesive. So definitely not ice cream, more like Brussels sprouts. You know, they, don't, <laughs> they don't taste very good initially, but you know in the long run, they're going to be good for you. <laughs> and in the long run, Borealis came out, my first film. And it did very well, it aired across Canada, um, did well in some film fests, but most importantly, the film was actually used by environmental groups in Ontario to broker a deal in 2009 with industry, First Nations, and the government in order to protect a large area of the boreal forest for future generations. So a great success story. Thank you. So with that, like a light bulb basically went off my head. You know, this camera is not just toddlers and tiaras. You know, this is, this is actually something I can do for good. So I looked for other projects. And one in BC I did was I, I, I biked, hiked, and kayaked the uh, GPS track of the Northern Gateway Pipeline and did a film called On the Line. So I gave a kind of a ground-level view of this controversial uh, subject um, in order to raise awareness about it. And then most recently, I did a journey uh, in the Arctic, looking at Arctic climate change in the context of a rowing a uh, trip through the Northwest Passage, where we actually interviewed Inuit and Inuvialuit uh, people about what they'd seen uh, in their long-term history and more recent history as far as climate change and what it was doing to their communities. So as I did these one after the other after the other, the difficult process of, of editing and sitting in front of a computer screen for hundreds of hours actually became quite enjoyable. I started to enjoy the creativity of it. And I especially valued the gift of being able to go into these remote communities and, and having the privilege of being able to allow them to tell me their story so I could share it with the world so these environmental, uh, these zones, these places that were threatened could actually be protected. So these experiences basically enriched my filmmaking and my journeys far more than when I was purely doing it for hedonistic pleasure. Thank you.